Hey Rebel EM crew, Salim Rezai here. I promised you guys a video on a poll that I had put out just a few days ago. Should we be giving sodium bicarbonate in diabetic ketoacidosis? And what I presented was a hypothetical adult patient with type 1 diabetes who ran out of their insulin several days prior to arrival. And they presented in diabetic ketoacidosis. And the key labs that came back were a pH of 6.6, a serum bicarbonate of 1.5, a CO2 of 19, an anion gap of 29, a potassium of 7.2, a glucose greater than 1,000, patient was clearly Kuzmol breathing with a respiratory rate in the 50s, and hemodynamically unstable with a blood pressure of 90s over 50s, and completely altered with a GCS of 9. And here are the two polls that I posted. One was on my Twitter account, and as you can see, there was about 84 400 people that voted and it was almost nearly an equal split. 56% said yes, they would give bicarbonate and 44% said no, they wouldn't. On my YouTube channel, I also posted the same poll and although not as many votes, you can see about the same as what we got on Twitter, which was 66% said yes and 34% said no. So I got a lot of answers from people and there were some people that were almost angry in their responses. And so I guess for the purists who say we should not be giving bicarbonate and DKA, I can understand their reasoning from a physiologic standpoint. And that is that when we give bicarbonate, it ultimately gets turned into carbon dioxide. And when we have a patient who's breathing in their 50s and they're blowing off as much CO2 as they can, are we really making just numbers look better or are we potentially adding more work to a patient who's already working that hard? Now, from an evidence-based medicine standpoint, the other answer I saw was there's no high-level evidence um, or randomized clinical trials that say that we should be giving sodium bicarbonate to these patients. Now, the top here, you'll see the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation or a version of it. And basically, yeah, you can see if we give bicarbonate, it combines with hydrogen and we create water and CO2. So I get it from a physiologic standpoint, and it's very valid in terms of the argument. But the lack of evidence argument I actually take issue with because an absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So we just cannot get a good randomized clinical trial with these patients that have pHs that are below 6.9 or 6.8. It just simply doesn't happen that often. There's not enough of them. It would take forever to recruit that number. And so this is where we have to kind of come into a no evidence zone and make a clinical decision. So let me start off by telling you what my keys are to all DKA patients, no matter what. The initial treatment is insulin, insulin, and more insulin because these patients are insulinopenic. I just made that word up, but that is what they are. They need more insulin. We want to use balanced crystalloids instead of sodium chloride because sodium chloride in and of itself is actually an acidotic uh, crystalloid and can actually worsen acidosis initially. And so we want to stick with something balanced. At my shop, we have lactated ringers. I don't know that there's any head-to-head -head evidence that one balanced crystalloid is superior to another, but just something to think about. And then we get to high flow nasal cannula. And I got a lot of questions about this. Is there good evidence for this? And no, there's not. Um, this is a clinical call. It's a theoretical mechanism of action in which we basically kill or improve some of that anatomic dead space with high flow nasal cannula so that we help decrease that work of breathing. Now, if my patient was not altered, then I would consider non-invasive ventilation. And I think that would be the ideal situation. But in a patient who's obtunded, my concern of them not protecting their airway and vomiting and then potentially aspirating doesn't seem like a good choice. I also saw some people that said intubation. And I think that is a sure way to kill this patient. And here's why. If they're already breathing 50 times a minute, what is the fastest rate I can set on my ventilator? I simply won't be able to keep up with the ventilator what the patient is already doing on their own. And so certainly I'm not thinking intubation with this patient, even though they are altered. 
What they need is insulin, insulin, insulin. They need balanced crystalloids and they need some time. And then the high flow nasal cannula maybe theoretically could help with work of breathing. Now, I will tell you that in 95% of my DKA patients, I will not use sodium bicarbonate. It should not be routine. Um, I know that ADA has this arbitrary pH of 6.9 or less. We should consider giving it, but that's just an arbitrary number. And so I would tell you that in 95% of my patients, there's no way I'm considering bicarbonate, no matter how much people push on me. Now, there are some patients that I would consider it, and I think you should as well. So that arbitrary number, pH of less than 6.9, okay, that's an acidotic patient. I think we can all agree anything less than 7 is pretty acidotic. And or hyperkalemia, which this patient had a potassium of greater than 7, with or without arrhythmias. Now, if they have arrhythmias, obviously I'm going to be more pushed to give them sodium bicarbonate. But even if they don't, uh, I'm still going to consider it. And then I would say hemodynamic instability, even with fluids and pressors. And this patient was getting pressors and was getting multiple liters of fluid and was still hemodynamically unstable. And or peri-arrest or cardiac arrest. And I think all three of these scenarios with a low pH should be something that makes us consider bicarbonate and DKA. Now, what's the best way to bicarb? Um, our amps of bicarbonate in the crash cart come as 8.4%, which if you look at the estimated milliosms per liter is about 2000 milliosms per liter. This is a really hypertonic solution. I mean, this is the equivalent of 6% saline. In Europe, um, not in the US, they have 4.2% sodium bicarb. And that gives us a estimated milliosms of 1000 milliosms per liter, which is about the same as 3% saline. So what I recommend if we're considering giving bicarbonate is diluting it, making it 1.3% sodium uh, bicarbonate. And that's three amps of bicarb in one liter of water. And that gets us closer to an isotonic solution, which is 300 milliosms per liter, or is the equivalent of 0.88% or 0.9% saline. So my takeaway, should we be giving sodium bicarbonate in DKA? I would say in 95% of the cases, that answer is no. There's no way we should be doing it. We need, they need insulin, they need balanced crystalloids, and they need time. But there will be about 5% of people, and I'm being arbitrary in that number, but I've seen it in my career enough times, a handful of times, that I am considering giving it. And that's going to be the patients that have a super acidotic pH, hyperkalemia with or without arrhythmias, or hemodynamic instability, even with fluids and vasopressors, or being peri-arrest slash cardiac arrest. In all of those scenarios, I think you should really think about sodium bicarbonate. If you're thinking about it, you want to give it in the most isotonic version of itself that you can. And the best way to do that is putting three amps in one liter of D5W, which has a milliosm of about 300 milliosms per liter, which is about close to what 0.9% sodium chloride is. So there you have it. That's my answer to the poll hypothetical patient, should we be giving sodium bicarbonate and DKA? I think the answer here is in 95% of the cases, the answer is no. We're not going to ever get high level evidence in these really acidotic patients because we just simply can't recruit enough of them. And we're going to have to use some clinical judgment here. And I hope I laid out three potential scenarios where you should consider it. And then also how to dilute it to keep the fluid isotonic. Let me know your thoughts, comments, and questions. Thank you for tuning in. And until next time.